Father, we thank you. Thank you because we know that we're going to have an awesome time again in your presence today. We give you all of the praise. In Jesus' mighty name, I be prayed. And let God's people say, Amen. Genesis chapter 20. So we started a series on how you can understand the whole book of Genesis. The old teaching series is online for free. From Genesis chapter 1 to Genesis chapter 19. For free. You don't have to pay. <laughs> it's on Facebook. It's on YouTube. It's on audio podcast, Apple Music, Amazon Music. All, all the audio mark is on all platforms for free. We just want to make sure everybody to an extent understands the gospel. And when we say the gospel, okay, cross over church. What's the gospel? Let's start from there. What's the gospel? Thank you. You're members of this church. <laughs> awesome. The gospel, the content of the gospel is Jesus died for our, he was buried. What happened on the third day? God raised him from the dead. If you have asked an average Christian about this gospel, and you tell them that the gospel did not start when Jesus was born in the New Testament. The gospel had been preached right from Genesis, the whole Testament. The gospel did not start in the New Testament. The gospel had been preached from the whole Testament using what they call parables, using what they call shadows, types. So during the time of Noah, for example, the gospel will be to be saved from the judgment, enter into the ark. And who is the ark? A type of Christ. Be bold about the cross. But you are righteous. A righteous man is bold. I've actually been in the Bible. Let me show you. Proverbs 28. Let's give Proverbs 28. A righteous man is bold. A righteous man is radically bold. Be bold. The Bible will say the righteous will be as, a, as bold as a lion. You can write it in Proverbs 28 verse 1. The righteous is as bold as a lion. So the gospel did not start when Jesus was born. But God has been communicating it in types and shadows. And in the old covenant, for sin offering, for example, they will bring a lamb without blemish. That's a picture of Christ who was going to be without sin. They will offer up the lamb without blemish. That will be the picture of Christ without sin who will be offered up for the sins of the whole world. So the lamb died in the place of the sinner so that the sinner can go scot-free as if he has never committed a sin. Jesus did not commit a sin, yet he died in our place so that when we believe now, we can stay in his own place and say we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Does it make sense? Makes sense, right? So that gospel has been communicated. Let me show you Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, everybody. Let's fight to Romans. We're coming back to Genesis chapter 20. Romans. We're going to start from verse 1. On my own Bible, the book of Romans is on page 1055. Romans chapter 1 from verse 1. Are we all there? If you're there, wave. Oh, nice. It was able to figure it out. Awesome. Romans chapter 1 from verse 1. So if you're still looking for Romans in your Bible, it's okay. <laughs> it's on the screen now. So let's all read together. It's on the screen. One, two, go. Don't take it away, you ready? <laughs> this letter is from Paul, a slave of Christ Jesus, chosen by God to be an apostle and sent out to preach his stop. So Paul was sent to preach what? By the way, every believer is sent to preach what? Is he only pastor? Just Pastor Yinka? <laughs> You know, I've been preaching this goodies before I became a pastor. You know, I just became a pastor less than one. He's not even up to one year. I've been preaching this. You know, I can't start preaching this overnight. If I was not preaching this before becoming a pastor, I won't be preaching this when I became a pastor. You understand what I mean, right? Okay. If they make you a pastor tomorrow, if you are not preaching the gospel before pastor, you can't automatically just start. You understand what I mean, right? Okay. Every believer is called to preach the gospel. For reference, Mark chapter 16 will tell you, go into all the world and preach the gospel the good news to our creature okay so that good news the bible says god promised this good news when long ago through his prophets in the holy scriptures who is the good news about verse three this good news is about 
Who is good news about? Jesus. So if I come and tell you and say, well, bro, I remember once upon a time, I used to be very poor. I don't have money. I don't even have shoes, shoes to walk. But now God has blessed me. I have one car, one house. I have shoes to wear now. If you want Jesus to do the same thing for you, just come to our church. Have I preached the gospel? <laughs> even the baby said no. <laughs> you communicated in a language. Okay, yes, yes. <laughs> so well, you know at times what I just said is what people preach and they say they preach the gospel. If the gospel is not about Jesus, you've not preached the gospel. The gospel is not, if you want God to change your life, you want to write an exam, if you want God to make you pass your exam, you want God to transform your relationship, that is not the gospel. This good news is about his son. How he died for our sins. He was buried and God raised him from the dead. If you don't hear that, you have not heard the gospel. So when you go to church, what should you, what should your expectation from your pastor is he must preach the gospel or else your pastor is wasting your time. You don't have to apologize about it. If, if we are not preaching the gospel in this church, look for a church. I'm not mixing words with it. Your life is very precious. So when you come to church, who should we make it about? About the pastor? My story cannot transform you. It's only his story that can make all the difference. It's all about what he did for all of us that we could never do for ourselves. What did he do? He died for our sins. He was buried and God raised him from the dead. You see what I'm preaching now? The Bible will say, if our gospel be hid, it is hid from those who the God of this world has blinded their eyes. In fact, the Bible will say the message of the cross is foolishness to those that are perishing. What I'm saying right now, dead bear. No, no. That simple message is what will save somebody. So whoever doesn't accept that, Bible is foolishness to those that are perishing. We have to preach this gospel. Whether we check the book of Genesis or the book of Revelation, it has to be gospel all the way. Who is the good news all about again? Jesus Christ. So when I carry Genesis, what am I looking for? Jesus. We're going to get to this story maybe next week. This is 20, okay. By next week, Sunday, I'll preach on Genesis chapter 22. The story where Abraham will carry Isaac to want to go and offer up Isaac. If we are looking for Jesus, then we should be think reading with Jesus' lens. So Isaac will ask Abraham, my daddy, or my father, or in their own like maybe Abba, here is the knife, here is the wood, where is the lamb for the bond offering? John, in the book of John, will say, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. So was God really interested in making Isaac die? No. God was creating a picture for us that at some point he was going to give up his son, his only son, whom he loved, for your sakes, for my sake. So this good news is about his son. When we read Genesis, we keep at the back of our mind, it's all about Jesus. Making sense? Making sense? Okay. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 20. Genesis chapter 20. We're going to start reading from verse 1. We're going to stop at verse 7. Genesis 20, 1 to 7. Genesis chapter 20. So Genesis is the first book of the Bible. Genesis, thank you. So it's on the screen if you're still looking for it as well. But if you read it as well in your Bible, if you want to tick any place, it's easier for you to tick it out. All right, so let's all read together. One, two, go. Abraham moved south to the Negev and lived there for a while between Kadesh and Shur. And then he moved to Gera, while living there as a foreigner. Okay, verse 2 now. Abraham introduced his wife, Sarah, by saying, she is my sister. So King Abimelech of Gera sent for Sarah and had her brought to him at his palace. But that night, God came to Abimelech in a dream and told him, 
you are a dead one. <laughs> For that woman you are thinking is already, who is God supposed to appear to? Abraham or Abimelech? Abraham. <laughs> Do you understand what's going on here? Do we understand what's going on here? Abraham says she's my sister. So I said, no problem. Now, God is coming for Abimelech. Okay, let's keep reading. You understand what I mean? Now? But Abimelech had not slept with her yet. So he said, Lord, will you destroy an innocent nation? Didn't Abraham tell me she is my sister? And she herself said, yes, he is my brother. I acted in complete innocence. My hands are clean. In the dream, God responded, yes, I know you are innocent. That's why I kept you from sinning against me and why I did not let you touch her. Now return the woman to her husband and he will pray for you for he is a, okay, then you will leave. But if you don't return her to him, you can be sure that you and all your people will. <laughs> so how do we interpret scriptures like this? So it started from who lied? Abraham. You see this story you just read. If you follow us from Genesis chapter one, this is the second time Abraham would do what he just did. Second time. If you remember, if you, if you go back to Genesis chapter 12, if you are take it at some point, you see it. Let's go to Genesis chapter 12 from verse 10. Genesis chapter 12. This is the second time Abraham did exactly the same thing. So it's not new. <laughs> Genesis chapter 12. Let's start from verse 10. You know what? Because of time, let's start from verse... Yeah, let's start from verse 10, actually. That's fine. Genesis chapter 12 from verse 10. The Bible says, at that time, a severe famine struck the land of Canaan, forcing Abraham to go down to Egypt, where he lived as a foreigner. Okay, what happened next? As he was approaching the border of Egypt, Abraham said to his wife, Sarah, look, you're a very beautiful woman. When the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. Let's kill him. Then we can have her. So please tell them that you are my <laughs> so this was the first time he did it then they will spare my life and treat me well because of blah blah, blah. but so my point i have to show you we read this technically actually when we're in genesis chapter chapter 12 as if abraham thought we are forgotten <laughs> and then in genesis chapter 20 again the exact same thing so now guess who stepped into the matter god guess what god said abraham is a prophet guess what god has said he will not pray for abimelech by the way, you see, over the years, when people talk about heroes of faith, Abraham, David, we need to speak about their flaws as well. <laughs> we, we, we talk about them at times as if they are up there. And you say, like, you should be like them. But the truth of the matter is, they also, they are, the Bible speaks about Elijah, that Elijah was a man of like passion. In other words, that's the book of James, by the way. They all went through similar things. They were also tempted. Some of them fell into temptation. So obviously, this is where I'm going. Abraham was not righteous because he did everything right. Does that make sense? Do you understand what I just said now? Do we understand what I just said? So Abraham was not made righteous because he did everything right. Why was he righteous? By? By faith. How are you made righteous today? By faith. Faith in who? Faith in Christ Jesus. So Abraham just lied to Abimelech. Abimelech took Abraham's wife because then, since he's your sister, God will say you are a dead man. <laughs> this is how God interrupted Abraham. God said you are a dead man. Why? Because Abraham lied. And God did not go and meet Abraham. He said, Abraham... I don't know if stories like this at times just make you ponder down on some things. I ever thought about this before. The same thing, yeah. So what we're about to talk on today is a very sensitive conversation. <laughs> okay, for a start, let, let's read a bit downward. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 20. 
and then we we'll start having discussions about it. Genesis chapter 20. Let's jump down to verse 8. Because when Abimelech woke up, he came for Abraham. Let me tell you what happened. Genesis chapter 20 from verse 8. Okay, it's on the screen. One, two, go. Abimelech got up early the next morning and quickly called all his servants together. When he told them what had happened, his men were? Where what? Okay, don't leave me. We're all reading together. Okay, verse 9. Then Abimelech called for Abraham. See what he said. What have you done to us? He demanded. What crime have I committed that deserves treatment like this, making me and my kingdom guilty of this great sin? No one should ever do. You see that Abraham was the guilty person, technically. Guess who, guess who it was? Who was the guilty person in all of this conversation? Abraham. This was the second time. I'm taking time to stay here so we can understand. Abraham was a man of like passion. God pronounced Abraham righteous. But this is Abraham again now. Yeah. God will still say he's a prophet. We're going to have a conversation about who is a prophet before at the end of this teaching. But I want to start from Abraham's story first. Before I got born again, I had my senses. I had my way of doing things. I was a sinner. When I got born again, I was made righteous, right? Right, did I got born again. But that doesn't mean I can't still be tempted in my former way of thinking. You all agree with that, right? I mean, even if you don't agree, I'll use myself as an example, and then you can, <laughs> in your mind, use yourself as an example, right? So it's possible for a man to be born again today. Let's say the man is addicted to drinking. And then when he gets born again, he's still addicted to drinking. It's possible. Talk to me, cross over, right? It's possible, right? It's possible. It's possible that you have, it could be anything. It could be anything in the world. But you got born again today. You know you're righteous today. You know your sins are forgiven. You know you're purified. You know you're sanctified. But yet you still, you're still tempted and you fall into temptation. Abraham just lied. He's righteous. Maybe righteous liar, but he lied. You understand what I mean? Do you all agree with that? This, talk to me. This happens. This is a, okay, do Christians still fall into sin after they get born again? Yes, now. So number one thing to, to bring out is, so when we get born again, then I'm going to teach it, 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 a sermon on the finished and the unfinished work of Christ. So the finished is what he has done. The unfinished is, since he has done what he has done, we allow that gospel to transform us. So for example, if I always get angry a lot before I go born again, if I'm still born again, I'll still be angry if I, I'll be tempted to be angry. Except I start allowing the love of God to control my heart. If I have issues with unforgiveness before I got born again, if I'm born again now, if I don't allow that gospel to transform my heart in that area, I will still have issues with unforgiveness. You understand what I mean, right? Do you understand what I mean? Is this strange? Is this strange? How many of you have never committed this since you got born again? You've never committed any since you got born again? Nobody. Nobody. So this shows that, so when a man gets born again, there is a part of you allowing the gospel to transform you from the inside out. Is it making sense? Is it making sense? Let me show you Ephesians. Let's go back to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4. From verse 21. Ephesians chapter 4. So it is possible for a man to be born. Because Abraham is just a, a good case study. Ephesians chapter 4. From verse 21. Okay, it's on the screen. Perfect. So let's all read together. I want everybody to read now. Let, let me hear your voice. One, two, go. Since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off your whole sinful nature and your former way of which is corrupted by and stop for a second. So as a believer, what should we learn to do now that we are born again? Okay, let's do it one more time. I, I want us to be in this together. This is how you even remember this when, when, we're, when we're trying to remember. So as a believer, it's our responsibility to throw off old sinful nature. So if I don't throw it off, if I don't start renewing my mind to the new me in Christ, it is possible, you see a man who is born again, and yet, he's still acting in the old way. You understand what I mean? 
Does that mean the man is no longer born again? No. Does that mean the man has lost his salvation? No, there's nothing like a man losing his salvation. But you can see a believer who is not allowing the gospel to transform him or her. You can see a believer who is not renewing his mind with the gospel. So it's almost as if the gospel is not reflecting in him or her. Is it making sense? Okay, give us the next verse. Instead, let the spirit renew your thought and... So as a believer, your thought, your attitude, your conduct is important. But how do you do that? You allow the Holy Spirit to renew that. You know what? Give us verse 24. I, I think I like verse 24. Put on your... So as a believer, what is that in quote, unfinished work of Christ that I have to do on my own? Since he has given me his righteousness, what do I now do? I now put on that new nature called righteousness. So if I don't put on the new nature called righteousness, and how do we do that? By reminding ourselves who we are. This is why we always tell you in church, you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So that the more you hear that, it starts influencing your conduct. Is it making sense? Is it making sense? So put on your new nature, created to be like, so your new nature is truly righteous and holy. So again, you can see a Christian who is born again, who is righteous and holy, living as if he's not. Why? Because he's not putting on the new nature. Is it making sense? And this is why at times, People don't really want, people have issues with people. They're like, is this person really born again? A lot of those stuff. But yeah, again, if you heard the gospel, you're born again. There's nothing we can do about that. You're born again, you're born again. Abraham lied. God still called him a prophet. Because it has, it will not, his nature is his nature because of what he believed. By faith, we said to that. A man is not made righteous because of what he does. A man is made righteous by faith. We can't do anything to that for the rest of our lives. But now that we are still here on heart, what should we do? We now allow that righteous nature, we put it on so that it can influence our conduct. Is it making sense? Is it making sense? It's possible for a Christian that they offend you, somebody hurt you, and then we have to call the whole of Canada to beg you before you forgive the person. It's possible, right? It's possible. But it's possible again that nobody has to beg you. <laughs> Another Christian and then you just find it easy to forgive because you've experienced God's forgiveness. Depending on the degree of how well you are allowing the gospel to transform you from the inside out. We are all, every one of us, work in progress. We are all allowing the gospel to transform us at various degrees, depending on how well we are allowing to transform us. You understand me, right? Is it making sense? So Abraham lied. There's nothing like white lie, black lie. Lie is lie, right? We don't justify like, like we don't justify sin. Our 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 hope is that there is forgiveness of sins for the believer. We have received forgiveness of sins. You understand what I mean, right? We don't say, oh, it's not. No, it is sin. But thank God, I'm still forgiven of all my sins. You understand what I mean? Abraham lied, but thank God, God has forgiven. Uh, uh, do you understand what I, mean, what I mean, right? So when a man gets born again, what does he have to do? Put on the new man. Very important. Created to be. Okay, let's keep reading. You see, when Paul was writing this, there are some people in church that were having a lot of wrong attitude, wrong behavior. Let me show you. Stop telling lies. You see? <laughs> so that means there was somebody who is lying in that church, right? Talk to me, right? Stop telling lies. There was somebody who is born again and is not allowing the truth of the redemption now to transform him or her from the inside out and the person was still telling lies. Paul had about it. Before he got to chapter 4, he told them in chapter 1, he said, in Jesus, you have redemption and forgiveness of sins. He told them, which the believer has. Your sins are forgiven. Since your sins are forgiven, then stop lying. <laughs> you, understand the, you understand the conversation, right? Every, Samantha, you understand, right? Stop telling lies. Let us tell our neighbors the truth. So if I'm a believer and I'm still lying, what should I do? I should stop telling lies. Is it making sense? So that my conduct can align with my nature. Again, it doesn't change your nature. Whether you still have a weakness, you're still trying to get over an addiction, you are still righteous 
as long as you believe in Jesus. Nothing in the world can ever change that. Not even you. Because it is what Jesus has done that made you righteous. Making sense? We, we, we must not, that you messed up doesn't change the fact that you are no longer, you are, you are righteous forever. In fact, okay, let me put this to you. A man is a sinner because he's in Adam. A man is righteous because he's in Christ. You are not righteous because, well, let's say you're in Adam before you go born again. I say, well, I will stop drinking. I will stop smoking. I will stop terrorizing. I will stop lying. So now I'm born again. It doesn't work like that. You can make new resolution. I want to stop this bad habit and you're not born again. How can a man be born again? This good news is about his son. How he died. He was buried and God raised him from the dead. You must be. You understand what I mean? So your good deed was not make you born again. Was not what make you born again. Was not what make you righteous. So your bad deed will not make you unrighteous. We said to that once after, right? You understand that, right? Okay. So you are righteous. We have said to that. Well, now let's talk about how you can get better in your conduct so that your conduct can now align with your nature. That's what we're talking about here. Making sense? So if we talk to believers, stop lying, stop doing this, stop lying. It's, it's not a condemnation conversation because we are not attacking your righteousness. It is condemnation when you tell the person, are you sure God will hear your prayer when you just mess up? That's condemnation. You're trying to put the person's status with God based on what they have done. You understand what I mean, right? But it is correction in love, a call to identity when you tell people, stop doing this. right? Because you're born again. Because you're righteous. Stop doing this. Stop living like this. Stop saying this. Stop lying. So that's what Paul was telling them. Stop telling lies. Give us verse 26. He addressed some other people. There's another person in that church who's always getting angry. Again, are they born again? Yes. Are they righteous? Yes. Are they forgiven? Yes. Are they sealed with the Holy Spirit? Yes. Some people will tell you if you if you sin, the Holy Spirit leaves you. That is not scriptural. You can't find that anywhere in the Bible. You think the Holy Spirit is a joke? It's not a joke. <laughs> now, you know, come. Now, now, that's not the Holy Spirit. The Bible says you've been sealed with the Holy Spirit in Ephesians chapter 1. So before he started talking about your conduct, he told you a lot about who you are. Are we writing? Are we judging anything? This is, this is very important. Again, you will preach this. So. That's what God told me. That everybody that will come to this church, you will end up preaching this goodness, whether to your friend, your family, or maybe someday in this church. If I go on vacation for one month, you know one of you have to preach, right? <laughs> right? You know the last time Aaron, he preached, right? <laughs> Aaron, are you ready to preach again? Where's your notepad? You have a lot of notes already? Okay. <laughs> okay, so, and don't let, okay, don't sin by letting anger control you don't let the sun go down while you're still angry so he's addressing somebody who's angry right can you be angry yes there's nothing really serious. you have emotions people will hurt you people will offend you but don't stay angry forever in your anger you remember that god god loves you we've done much more things to god he forgave us god has never been angry with you never so i'll just let it go right you can be angry. People will hurt you. People will actually hurt you. I'm not saying you should not be angry. Just not. But don't stay in anger. He said, don't let the sun. Okay, anyway. Okay, for anger gives a foothold to the devil. So when a man stays in the emotion called anger for a long time, the enemy will start suggesting negative thoughts to you. You will start even wishing death for the person you're angry at. Yeah, it's, it's true. Don't let anger control you. This is not a personal determination. This is what comes from the inside out. How do you put on the new nature? Give us the name. If you are a thief, you see? You see? A born-again thief. <laughs> you see this again? What should the person do? Quit stealing. So what should the person now do now? Instead, use your hand for good hard work and then give generously to... So that's the beauty of the gospel. From taking... Now, start giving. Do you, do you understand? Is this in your Bible? Did, am I quoting this off? Is this in your Bible? So what should Abraham stop doing? Stop lying. What should he start doing? Start telling the truth. Do you understand what I mean? If I have issues with anger, Pastor Yenka, what should you do? Pastor Yenka, stop getting angry. What should I say? Start loving and forgiving. Right? This conversation, there's nothing serious about it. We should have it. <laughs> if I'm missing church, If I'm missing church, what should I do? Stop missing church. And what? Start coming much more. If I'm not coming on Wednesday, if I'm not start coming, right? <laughs> we are laughing. Some of us laughing. We know this. Are, we are laughing. But again, this is a, 
what we call it call to identity. And it's good when we remind ourselves these things. I mean, I think it's important that we remind ourselves, right? It's important we remind ourselves, right? Yeah. Now, there's somebody in that church who is always abusing people. <laughs> A person is always abusing people. So let's all read this together. I want to go. Don't use foul or abusive language. Somebody is always using profanity in that church. And the person is born again. But the person is always using profanity. <laughs> always using profanity. So Paul will tell the person in chapter 1, your sins are forgiven. He has sealed you with the Holy Spirit. In fact, in chapter 2 of Ephesians, the Bible says, God raised us together and made us sit at the right hand of the Father. Chapter 3, Paul was saying, I'm praying for you so that you can understand the length, the breadth, the width, and the height of God's love. Chapter 5, and I said, you know what? But if you're lying, stop lying. If you're stealing, stop stealing. If you're angry, stop getting angry. And this one, I said, if you're always using foul and abusive language, what should the person do? Don't use those language. Now, imagine what Paul, the way Paul teaches, if you're at the extreme of the, of the wrong, he wants you to be at the extreme of the right. So instead of using profanity, he said, let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who so from cursing people making them feel discouraged now start blessing them so they can be encouraged so if you are like oh what the f is you know the father bless you <laughs> or you're like somebody's a pain in your you say, you mean jesus took your pain <laughs> But you understand what he's, what he's talking about, right? How did you get here? Abraham brought us here. Because Abraham was a righteous man who was a liar. Right? I mean, you saw it in the Bible. Right? But number one, is he still righteous? Yes. So you got born again, you've messed up. Are you still righteous? Yes. So what should you do? Stop leaving that part and then start putting on the new nature. What's your new nature? Righteousness and holiness. Is he making sense, Professor? Right? Okay. Let's see. Is there any other verse there again? Do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Remember, he has identified you as his own. You see, the person he was writing to were the people that were stealing in the church. You remember, right? The people that were lying, the people that were... And he said, remember, he has identified you as his own, guaranteeing you that you will be saved on the day of redemption. Talking about your bodily redemption now. You put on a new body. There's, there's a new body Jesus will give to you. That's the day he's talking about. Let's see verse 32. I think that's the last verse. verse okay, let's, verse, let's see verse 32. Is, that, is this the last? No, there should be verse 31 verse 32. Instead, be kind to each other. So as a Christian, what should we do? We should be kind to each other. Tender at it, forgiving one another, just as God, through Christ, asks, will God forgive you? Okay, let's read it again. As God, through Christ, has forgiven you. So will God forgive you in the future? Has he forgiven you? You have to understand this part. Will God forgive you? Has he forgiven you? Aaron, will God forgive you? No. <laughs> Aaron, you got to stay with me. <laughs> okay, let's do it one more time. Forgiving one another just as God, through Christ, has forgiven so will God forgive you? Has he forgiven you? Awesome. I like this church. Who is your pastor? <laughs> so why do we forgive people today? Because he has forgiven us. Awesome. What if they don't deserve it? Should we still forgive them? Why? Because he has forgiven us. Do we have to call the whole of Winnipeg to beg you before you forgive you? <laughs> why? What if the person is very annoying? Should we forgive them? They said yes, for the purpose of recording. <laughs> Why? Because the Lord has forgiven you. What if the person did what you call a, a deal breaker? Should you still forgive them? Why? Because the Lord has forgiven you. If I don't forgive, what am I doing? I'm not throwing off the whole nature. I'm, not, I, I, I'm refusing to put on the new nature. Am I still born again? Yes. Am I still righteous? Yes. But I don't want to be a righteous man who doesn't forgive people. Right? Well, he asked the question. He said, what if we forgive, we don't forget? Let me answer your question. Give us Hebrews, since you ask. Hebrews chapter 10. 
Let's see verse 17. Hebrews 10, 17. We are trying to answer the question of forgiving and don't forget. Let's see what God, if God forgives and not forget, we will learn from God. Then he says, this is God speaking through the Holy Spirit. I will never again, what? Remember their sins and knowledge. Does God remember our sins? Are you sure? Should we remember people's sins? <laughs> we're, we're all growing, right? Like I said, at, at various levels, we're all growing. So if I'm finding that to forget somebody's sin, that means I've not possibly even forgotten, forgiven them. I have a chance. Does, does that make sense? You see, let me say this to you. By the grace of God, there is nobody on the surface of the heart, personally, that I have anything against. Are, are people offended me? Yes. Have I hurt people? Yes. You are in planet world. You will hurt people, they will hurt you. But as far as me, I'm concerned to people, I love everybody. No, nothing against anybody. Why? Because I've been forgiven. I've experienced the love of God. So what should we do as Christians? We should forgive people. Why? And I was asking the other time, because the Lord has forgiven us. So let me say this then. If you don't know you've been forgiven by God, you'll find it hard to forgive people. You agree with that, right? This is why your church, they should be preaching the forgiveness of sins. This is why we preach the Lord in this church. Right? It's better I keep preaching the forgiveness of sins to you because it's easier for you to forgive people. If I don't remind you how God has forgiven you of all your sins, past, present, and future, you will find it hard to forgive people. Making sense up to this point? Okay. Thank you so much. So now we just sort the topic of Abraham, a righteous person who still has issues with lying. Right? So what should Abraham do? Stop telling lies. If Paul had written to Abraham, he would have said, Abraham, stop telling lies. You're a righteous man. But is he still righteous? Yes. There's one billion dollar question people always ask. Am I still righteous when I mess up? What's the answer? Yes. Because you're, you were righteous in the first place because of your faith, not because of your works. So your works will not will ask to align with your nature. But when you mess up, it doesn't change your righteous identity. Have you ever seen this scripture before? Do the righteous fall seven times. What's he going to do afterwards? Talk to me. What will he do after seven times? He'll rise again. Actually, that's what the Bible says. The man who is righteous, you rise, get up. Those say, oh, I've done so many things. You are not your mess. Move, get up. <laughs> right, get up and stop telling lies. Stop getting angry. Let go on forgiveness and move on with your life. Okay, let's go back to Genesis. Let's start wrapping up. Genesis chapter... Genesis chapter 20. Genesis chapter 20. The book of Genesis chapter 20. Are we there? Genesis chapter 20. Let's go to verse 7. Genesis 27. Genesis chapter 20, verse 7. Okay, it's on the screen. Everybody, let's read this together. I want to go. Now, return the woman to her husband, and he will pray for you, for he is a... Stop. So before I wrap up today, I want to answer the question of, how do I know a prophet? How will I know if Pastor Yinka is from God? <laughs> if he preaches the gospel, awesome. This church, I like this church. You ready? You are ahead of me already. So am I a prophet from God? <laughs> let's check my message. <laughs> People ask that question a lot, right? Who is a true prophet? Who is a genuine prophet? Jesus had a lot to say about a prophet. Let me show you John. So let's quickly study a bit about prophet. So that if anybody comes to meet you and say, I'm a prophet, you have to check some things before you believe them, right? John chapter 1, verse 45. So let's stay a bit on prophet, prophet, prophet. And then you know if you're a prophet too, right? You also know now. We'll find out. A prophet. So the Bible says, Philip went to look for Nathaniel and told him, we have found the very person, Moses, and the prophets. So, prophet, by the way, he's talking about your whole testament. It can be summarized into Moses and the prophets. Genesis to Malachi can be summarized to Moses and the prophets. So, who did they write about? Jesus. His name is Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. So, how do we know you prophet? Number one, they will write about Jesus. Making sense? Is it making sense? Okay, I've actually did this from the Bible. Okay, let's go to John chapter 5. John chapter 5. Let's start from verse, let's do a long read. Maybe from verse 36. John chapter 5, or maybe from verse 30. Yeah, from verse 36, actually. 
John chapter 5. We're just trying to see prophets, prophets, what the Bible says of a prophet. Bible says, I have a greater witness than John. My teachings are my miracle. The Father gave me these works to accomplish, and they proved that he sent me. Verse 37. And the Father who has sent me has testified about me himself. You have never heard his voice or so seen his face to face. Verse 38. Let's do verse 39. Okay, you search the scriptures. What is the scriptures in this context? Genesis to Malachi. Because there was no Matthew, Mark, Luke as at that time. So the scriptures as at that time will be Genesis to Malachi. Making sense? Making sense? Okay. But the scriptures point to... So who does the scripture point to? So if we want to study the scripture, who should we keep at the back of our mind that we're studying about? Okay. Verse 40 now. Yet you refuse to come to me to receive this life. Okay, verse 41. We can jump to verse 45 this time. Just slide to verse 45. Yet, it isn't I who will accuse you before the Father. Moses will accuse you. Yes, Moses, in whom you put your hopes. Verse 46 now. If you really believed Moses, you would believe me because he wrote about questioner. So who is Moses? A prophet. Awesome. How do we know a prophet? Number one, they will write about they will write about Jesus. A prophet will write about Jesus. Is it making sense? A prophet will write about Jesus. But in our generation today, we don't have too much of writing prophet. We have too much of speaking prophet. So who will a prophet speak about? Don't answer yet. Let me show you. Luke 24. Give us Luke 24. Let, let's just see Bible, right? Because, again, if people come and tell you I'm a prophet and then they are preaching and they are not pointing to Christ, you will know what to say. All right? Luke 24, let's start from verse maybe 26. Luke 24, verse 26. Luke 24, verse 26. The Bible says, wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah would have to suffer all these things before entering into his glory. Jesus would say, was it not predicted? Was it not said? Predicted. Verse, next verse. Then Jesus took them through the writings of, of who? Moses. And all the explaining from all the, the thing concerning who? So when you are reading prophecies in the Old Testament, who are they speaking about? Jesus. Is it making sense? So when you read some of the things they say in the Old Testament, who do you think they're talking about? Isaiah will say, in the last day, the mountain of the Lord will be exalted far above every other mountain. Who do you think he's talking about? Because God will raise Jesus from the dead. And that will be the mountain of the Lord being exalted far above every other mountain. Moses will tell people, if you look up to this bronze snake, you'll be saved. Jesus in John chapter 3 will say, as Moses lifted up the bronze snake in the serpent, in the wilderness, so also the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that anyone who believes in him shall have everlasting life. So prophet, a prophet will write and speak about the Messiah. We read it in Romans chapter 1 too as well the other time. You know what? Why you're still here? This is verse 28, right? Give us, drop down to verse 43. Luke 24 from verse 43. Luke chapter 24 from verse 43. And he ate it as they watched. Verse 44 now. Then he said, when I was with you before, I told you everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophet and under Psalms must be. You see, just repeating the word, all the prophet, all the prophet, all the prophet. Is it making sense? Okay, so what did they say? Then he opened their mind to understand the scripture. Stop. So how can I really understand the scripture? I have to know that it is all about Jesus. So if I don't keep Jesus at the back of my mind, can I ever understand the scripture? No. I can be going to church for 10 years, but if I don't make it about Jesus, I won't understand. Give us verse 46. Let me see if there's any other thing there. And he said, yes, it was written long ago that the Messiah would suffer and die and rise from the dead on the third day. So we talked about this. this so what is this? This is the gospel. Gospel is about how he will die, 
he will bury it and God will raise him from the uh, on the third day, right? So to be a prophet, what would you do? Is it that your life is communicating the gospel, your words communicate the gospel, or your writings communicate the gospel? So a prophet is a prophet that preaches or points you to Jesus and what he has done for you. Okay, question now. Let me test you. So if I come to tell you and I say, well, I'm a prophet, and I want to prophesy who the next prime minister will be, it's going to be this person. Are you going to say, hmm, he's a prophet from God? What would you say? Let me know, let me know. Does that qualify me to be a Bible definition of a prophet? Okay, what if I prophesy and I scare you with my prophecy? Does that make me qualify? <laughs> we don't have too much time today. You know what? If I'm preaching on Wednesday, I'll take it off from here, this prophet conversation. But I want to wrap up from this. So let's go to 1 Corinthians 14. So we know what the prophet before the cross is. You point people to Jesus, his death, burial, and resurrection. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 3. We we'll wrap up on this verse now. First Corinthians chapter 14, verse 3. First Corinthians chapter 14, verse 3. So a prophet prophesies, right? You all agree with that. A prophet prophesies. So before the time of Jesus, to be a prophet, you are speaking about the one who is to come. In fact, I want to say a word. I want you to write it down. I want you to write this statement down. Your whole testament, your whole testament, which is also called the scriptures, Aaron, let's write it down. <laughs> Aaron, today's a good day. <laughs> so the Old Testament, also referred to as the scriptures, consists of prophecies and God's promises about Jesus, how he will die, he will be buried, and how God will raise him from the dead. If they ask you, what's the summary of your Old Testament? You will say it consists of prophecies and promises about how God will raise Jesus from the dead because he will die, he will be buried, and God will raise him. I've had unbelievers asking before. When, when we went to preach at Kildona Park, there was a Sunday like that we didn't have service here. Went to Kildona Park. When I was there, one guy asked me, So, how come you guys have Old Testament and you have New Testament? I said, Well, the Old Testament points us and make God, to God's promise about how he will raise Jesus from the dead. And in the New Testament, Jesus came, he fulfilled that. So what God said he will do, he has done. What did he say he will do? He will raise Jesus from the dead. Does it make sense? That's why you have your Old Testament. Old Testament is God made the promise. New Testament is God has fulfilled the promise. You, did you all write this down? This is very important. This is why your Old Testament is as important as your New Testament. And they don't have different messages. They have the same thing. The difference is one was looking forward to it. And the other one, it has happened. Is it making sense? So the prophets were looking forward to it. But in your own case, you are looking back to it. Is it making sense? God has done that which he said he will do. Okay. First Corinthians 14 says, But one who prophesies, strengthens others, encourages them, and comforts them. So if anybody says, I'm a prophet, I want to prophesy to you. The prophecy must strengthen, comfort, and encourage you. So to pass as a prophet of the New Testament, you need to have words of encouragement. We've taught on prophecy before in this church. Remember? Let me remember. Speak drag it. There are parts 1 to part 10 online if you want to listen to it for free. Speak drag it. So a prophet in the Old Testament will speak about the Jesus who is to come. In the New Testament, he has come. So with that understanding, we can encourage one another with what he has done. With that understanding, we can... Okay, this is another version. Oh, this is another. This is another. Anyway, we can strengthen one another, we can encourage one another, and we can edify one another. Does it make sense? Okay, let's rise to our feet. Uh, have you been blessed? Do you think it's worth your time today? Okay. So the summary of what we've learned today is, number one, Abraham was a righteous man, but he, he, he still found himself lying even after God pronounced him righteous. But yet, God still called him a prophet because who God has made you is who you are. And in your own case, God has made you righteous. He has called you holy. You're righteous, you're holy. Your mistakes does not redefine your identity in Christ. Is that making sense? 
your mistake has nothing to do with your identity in Christ. You are still righteous. You are still holy. You are still saved. You still have the Holy Spirit. You are still justified and you are still sanctified. Is it making sense? So, but what if we now see a Christian, somebody who understands this gospel, and then we still find it in time to put off the old man. You tell the man, put on the new nature, which is created after God to be truly righteous and to be truly holy. Also, we saw that Abraham was a prophet. So, who is a prophet in the Old Testament? The one that will speak about the coming Messiah. Isaiah will say, unto us a child is born, a son is given. And he was talking about Jesus, who is to come. Right? He's talking about Jesus, who is going to come. Joel or Jonah will be in the belly of the fish for three days. And Jesus will be in the belly of the grave for three days. On the third day, Jonah will be spewed from the fish. And then on the third day, God will raise Jesus from the dead. So that qualifies Jonah to be a prophet because his life just communicated the gospel. How Jesus will die. He will be buried. And what will happen on the third day? God will raise him from the dead. So this same gospel, we are all going to preach it. So for somebody who is born again for many years and is not preaching the gospel, what do we tell the person? Put on the new nature and start preaching the, the gospel. Making sense, everybody? Father, we thank you. Thank you because your word is just awesome and we've been really blessed tonight. And we know that we will go in the consciousness of who we are in you and we'll start bearing much more good fruit will be a lot of good fruit, including preaching this good news to people, letting them understand that God has done that which he promised to do by raising Jesus from the dead, and that by their faith in this truth, they can also be made righteous, holy, purified, sanctified, and justified to the glory of your name. We will remember this truth as well, not only on Sunday, even on Tuesdays, on Thursdays, and every day of our lives. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray. And let God's people say, Amen.